Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the Mayor Baba program. I'm Fred Stankis of the Mayor Baba Center here in Southern California. Today's program is Baba's Five Perfect Masters. Mayor Baba was brought down as the Messiah or Avatar of the Age by five perfect masters who are always on earth at all, at any given time. And in, in his particular advent, these are the five perfect masters. First of all, there's a photo here that I have uh, represented of Harzad Babijan. She was a woman saint, a Muslim, who lived to be over between 130 and 140 years old. She was the uh, perfect master that kissed Meher Baba on the forehead when he was uh, coming back from school one day, from high school, uh, actually, excuse me, first year of college. Uh, and she, I uh, uh, will talk about her, and then, of course, besides Harzad Babajan, there is Narayan Maharaj, uh, who also was one of Baba's masters. And then from that, we will then go to the Taj, Tajuddin Baba, a Muslim. By the way, Narayan was a Hindu, so you have a Muslim woman, a Hindu, and now another Muslim master. And then we come to Sai Baba of Shirdi. There's a current Sai Baba that uh, is very popular throughout the world, but this is the original Sai Baba of Shirdi, who is uh, revered both by Muslims and Hindus, and a unique story about him in India. And then, of course, there is Upasni Maharaj of Sikori. And Upasni is extremely uh, powerful master who was one of Baba's five perfect masters and he threw a stone and hit Meher Baba on the forehead and uh, that basically brought Meher Baba down to physical consciousness after he was immersed in God consciousness for quite a length of time. Uh, and this film that we're going to see here is it's going to show a little bit of Meher Baba and uh, also it's going to show Baba's five perfect masters which are represented on the film too. Um, Meher Baba was born on February 25th, 1894, and he lived until January 31st, 1969. And people from all over the world consider him the avatar of the age. Um, and each one of these perfect masters met Meher Baba during his era, in his early years, and they each handed him certain things that uh, were responsible. Um, a real, uh, really speaking, a sad guru or perfect master has no regular occupation in the world or daily routine. A sad guru's work is to emancipate others from their worldly bondage and uh, the various mediums uh, they employ and the manner in which they work can be called uh, his occupation. Here's Meher Baba as a youth and uh, there he is. Uh, that's probably in the days when he just was kissed on the forehead and then he used to beat his head on the ground and he'd cover that bandage, cover his forehead with a bandage to uh, keep the marks uh, from not being uh, visible. And that's in the 1920s photos of Baba. And um, there's some more photos of Meher Baba. These are the uh, early years in the 20s uh, to the early 30s. And there's Baba in some of the Western garb. Now these are Baba's five perfect masters depicted here. There is Harzad Babajan. And then after Harzad Babajan is Narayan Maharaj. And then Tajuddin Baba some really interesting stories we're going to hear about Taj. And there's Sai Baba of Shirdi. And there's Upasni Maharaj of Sikori. To begin uh, talking about the masters, it's interesting, um, first of all, to bring up Parzad Babajan. 
Babajan was born to very, very wealthy parents, a uh, very beautiful young lady, and her name was Guru uh, before you know it became Harzad Babajan. And uh, she, right away at a young age, was extremely interested in all the spiritual things. Being a Muslim family, she memorized the Quran by heart. She knew it backwards and forwards, and she would be very well educated. She spoke so many languages, including English, and so she was able to converse with many people in many ways. Uh, her parents, of course, wanted to marry her off because of her beauty and, of course, uh, part of the tradition, you know, uh, getting married, uh, and they wanted to introduce her to some fine uh, families to get married. But she, of course, uh, wasn't into that, and she actually ran away. and. Uh, she lived, uh, of course, uh, more or less on her own for many, many years, and of course was guided to other saints and masters who helped her. But there is a story uh, where these uh, uh, soldiers hearing her make a declaration that she said, it is I who have created all. I am the source of everything. See, when she attained God realization, she felt that extreme, unbelievable experience. And so there was a mob of fanatic uh, Balaluchi soldiers, uh, and they were so upset about it, they said, you're a heretic, you're blasphemy, uh, is going to cause uh, pain in, in, our, in our family, in our neighborhoods. We're going to take measures against you. And so what they did is they buried Babajan alive. She was buried, uh, Babajan was buried alive, and she was uh, uh, buried in the upper, upper northern part of India, uh, actually Baluchistan, and there she is. And, and so they buried her, and ten years passed, and in the ten years, Babajan was found on a street in Bombay by these same soldiers, and upon seeing her, they, of course, were, were aghast, and they, they repented to her and said, Oh my, we're awful sorry what we did. We, we are ignorant. And so they prostrated themselves before her and said, We would like to serve you. And so they became her guards and attendants. She was unusual because uh, miracles were associated with Baba John. And uh, she was a physician in her own unusual manner. If someone was sick who approached her, uh, for relief, she'd uttered, this child is suffering from pills. The pills really meant that the person suffered from the impressions or of his or her life and actions. Baba John would take hold of the painful part of the body, and, and, some, and, and she would mysteriously call to an imaginary soul, and then she would then shake the afflicted part two or three times and tell the cause, the impressions, the sanskaras, to go. This method of treatment inevitably cured the sufferer of his or her complaint. And one day a Zoroastrian child who was completely, uh, who lost his sight, was, was brought to, to Babajan. She took the child in her arms and mumbled something and then blew uh, her breath upon the child's eyes. And immediately the child regained his vision and jumped out of her lap crying, I can see, I can see. So Babajan was, was very unique and she seldom would eat uh, she would almost have to be sort of guided to eat. One of her attendants was appointed as uh, Baba's duty to look after her personal needs, Baba John's duty. And he was a very good humored person. And whenever he would ask Baba John to eat, he would jokingly say, Ama Sahib, the uh, Jodana, the patch of cloth, is ready now. This referred to Baba John's constant protest that eating was like patching a torn cloth. Meaning that the ingesting food was similar to patching the cloth of a body to preserve it. And Baba John would constantly mutter seemingly incoherent phrases such as, Vermin are troubling me incessantly. I brush them away and they gather again. She would then vigorously brush her body as if removing dust or cobwebs. And Duster Cobwebs, according to Mir Baba, he explained that the infinite number of impressions that we have are attracted to the five perfect masters and are purified or annihilated in their divine fire, these yoga yoga sanskaras. If the sanskaras are purified, they return, spreading all over the universe as spiritual sanskaras. Isn't that amazing? The five perfect masters were like taking our garbage from us, recycling it, 
purifying it, and then sending it back to the universe, bringing a spiritual vibration. So, in that way, perfect masters' bodies serve as centers for collecting and cleansing the universal sanskaras or impressions of the world. So, see, now people will ask, what's the duty of a perfect master? Well, you just heard what it is, according to Mayor Baba. They're here to purify the impressions of humanity. They take them on and repurify them. And so, in this way, the perfect master's bodies serve as centers for collecting and cleansing the universal sanskaras of the world, and again, disseminating them as spiritual sanskaras. If the perfect masters annihilate sanskaras, then they are gone or wiped away out of the universal flow of mental, subtle, and gross sanskaric impressions. So, the perfect masters, my gosh, you could see why they're necessary on earth. Can you imagine what would happen? It's like when you do a vacuuming and you vacuum up all the dust and dirt it has gone away. Can you imagine if that all continually accrued? So perfect masters have their duty in that respect. And, and so uh, a sad guru, a perfect master, is God in human form. They've reached a God in, uh, God in a realization process. And they're an individual who has become God and he is beyond all bounds. His every activity is outside the scope of one's human, human limited vision. And uh, now we, we go to Narayan Maharaj, who was also one of Baba's five perfect masters. Believe me, I'm just covering a little bit because there's probably enough on these five perfect masters to have a series of, of who knows, 13, 14 weeks of study of them. But Narayan Maharaj... Uh, literally, which means God the King, was a Jamali master. That means he was gentle, kind, childlike, and seldom abusive. Uh, his disciples claimed that his physical appearance did not change for nearly 30 years. He had perennial youth. Uh, though extremely short in stature, his lean body had beautiful definition and sub subtleties like a yogi's. His spiritual root was that of Raja Yoga. And Raja Yoga is that of one of uh, complete austerity, penance, renunciation, and sacrifice. And some of his disciples claimed that the spiritual lineage was connected to Dineshawar, the youngest of the Sadgurus who centuries before lived in the same district of Maharashtra near Bombay. Narayan has adorned in his palace a large painting of Dineshawar, meaning the great yogi Changdeva. Narayan, once the naked Raja Yoga who had suffered terrible penance and ascetic denial, was now regally attired in silk and velvet clothes with gold embroidery and diamond buttons. Uh, there is an unbelievable picture here of, uh, well, this is uh, Narayan sitting on the golden throne. He was very fortunate. Uh, uh, one of his close disciples was uh, a lady who came to him, and she, uh, she needed help, and so he helped her, and she donated her, her very much of her wealth to him and made sure that he lived regally. Even though he lived like this, he was totally detached of all these things that were bestowed on him. Um, there is a, a, f a photograph here too of uh, the master that he, in Hindu uh, mythology, Dachatre uh, would worship this Dachatre statue. And Dachatre, with the arms and heads, would come alive. And uh, Narayan was connected with Dattatre in his pursuit uh, on the path. And uh, a perfect master's ways are unique and are truly beyond normal intellectual understanding to grasp their significance. In accordance with Hindu rites, Narayan Maharaj would worship Lord Dattatre and impress upon his disciples to do the same. Every day, early in the morning, he himself would take darshan of the marble statue of Dattatre in the temple, which is said to have come alive, and then he would give darshan to his followers. Narayan himself would lead a procession in honor of Dattatre held every Thursday and sing melodious bhajan songs to the gathering. Um, there is an incident where in Nar Narayan's life where he met Meher Baba and uh, it said in April of 1915 while D Narayan was holding Darshan with his uh, disciples on his silver throne suddenly 
a stream of light shone through the crowd, and a ragged young youth appeared before him, divine wine pouring from his eyes. The, youth, the young man was dazed. It was the Zoroastrian youth that Babajan had kissed. Narayan immediately dispersed the crowd and came down from his seat. Gently taking the young man by the hand, he led him to the throne, and taking a garland from his own neck, placed it onto the youth's. He then gave the young man fresh mango juice to drink. After finishing the juice, the young man arose from the throne, bowed to Narayan, and disappeared out of the door. Narayan kept gazing at the youth until he was out of sight, and he seemed extremely pleased. For the remainder of that day there was no more darshan, and his devotees wondered who that youth must have been to have been seated upon their master's throne. That was Mirababa, and that was the one of the first contacts. There is an interconnection between these five perfect masters. They interconnected, and uh, for instance, Upasni Maharaj was, was connected with Narayan Maharaj and also with Sai Baba of Shirdi. And so there is a connection between all of them. They were uh, independent of each other, but yet connected in the same way. Um, now we go on to Tajuddin Baba, Taj. Taj is extremely amazing. He was um, born of a Muslim family, and uh, his story goes to where he being a God-realized being, would have a, uh, also some eccentric habits. Uh, and one was, was where he would basically walk across fields totally almost with little or no clothes at all. And there was one day, there was a polo match. Um, there was some English gentlemen and their ladies and officers of the English military in the stadium during the polo match. And Taj walked across the polo field during the match and of course was stark naked. One of the fine ladies in the crowd was quite upset about it and she became quite emotional and she basically passed out. The husband, an officer in the British military, of course was quite uh, alarmed about it and he yelled to some of the other men, the officers, arrest that man. He has basically put my wife into ill state of mind. So Taj was arrested and brought before a tribunal and a court and a magistrate and after the proceedings he was sentenced to this insane asylum uh, for the criminally insane. And so in this insane asylum he, was, he began to become revered because of his nature, the peace, the guards would come to him. He was given the menial duties of breaking stones in the yard, doing the work of prisoners, but the guards would try to lobby for him, try not to give him that work because they knew this was not an ordinary man. And so at night, uh, Taj would say, if you don't see me in the cell, I'll be back in the morning. Mysteriously, with the locks of the prison uh, cells uh, totally locked, they'd come uh, sometimes at midnight and see Taj's uh, cage empty. And somebody would say, well, we just saw him downtown. He was in the village doing something. And so in the morning, they'd come back and Taj would be back in his cell. So the guards, of course, said, listen, <laughs> he could leave if he wanted to, but he doesn't want to. He knows he's doing work here. So word got around about this man's greatness. And so what happened, this perfect master was starting to become a, an attraction. The prison actually had to have visiting hours for the neighboring people to come and the and local people to come and visit Taj for his blessings. The guards, the, some of the military, the villagers, the people in the area. And one day a very rich, wealthy uh, Maharaj came by and uh, was quite, quite impressed with Taj and said to the prison warden, what do I do? to take him, I'd like to bring him out, I'd like to have him. And they said, well, you'll have to work out something with the authorities. And so this man paid a huge bounty, a price to the government, and he was released into this man's custody. This Maharaj has this huge estate. He has a guest house, he has a, a main palace. Maharaj, uh, the Maharaj gave Tajuddin Baba this guest house. And this guest house, 
had a huge area of like a parade grounds uh, with, with country fields and, and various rolling hills. And so Taj uh, would, would uh, with his creative mind, said, you know, this land is too beautiful just to let go for waste. I'd like to use it. And so how did he use it? In this area where there was shade and the big tree, maybe it would take 50 to 100 yards of space, he would say, I want people to gather here at 7 a.m. in the morning that are afflicted with disease and illness. I will tend to them. And then he had another area, which was sort of like flat parade ground area. He says, I want all the students, those that are studying, wanting to pass exams, to come here. And then he'd have another area uh, divided in the land where he says, those suffering legal problems or business problems, who are merchants, who want, pro uh, want to solve their problems in business to come here. And then he had a final place, which was beautiful and nice and shady, where he said, those seeking spiritual uh, uh, lessons and advancing on the spiritual path, come here. Everybody used to assemble at 7 a.m. every morning. So what would happen? many, many people started to assemble. Taj would walk out of his room at 7 in the morning and start walking through all these, you could say, quadrants of people. And he'd pass through them. That's all he'd do, just walk through them. And as he walked through them, people would report uh, in days passing by how they had improved in their health, in their business uh, the solutions, and their court cases were, were, were rectified and uh, students would pass exams and of course uh, the spiritually minded would seem to get a boon on the path. So all those things were, were part of the uh, uh, experience with Tejuddin Baba and of course his uh, legend grew and grew to where people from all around that whole district uh, in India and even other parts of India would want to come and visit him. And so he was so revered. Uh, and here's another uh, picture of him uh, depicted with like a halo of light, uh, Tadradin Baba. And this is really uh, remarkable how he, uh, he would be depicted there, a, a simple man powerful man. You see all these perfect masters, you could see that they have really no need for anything material. The material is, according to them, is like the stage play and they know what is really necessary and so they would have the most minimum amount of clothes or, or possessions and they wouldn't need them. In fact, they would usually give them away. Uh, uh, as uh, Taj's spiritual reputation uh, spread, his relatives gradually came to accept him as someone great. And one time, Taj's aunt made him tea. He refused to drink it, and pointing to his, his left told her, take this tea to a fox lying dead in that field. The old woman did as instructed. When she poured a little of the tea down the dead animal's throat, the fox shook, sat up, and ran away. <laughs> That miracle, of course, caused more and more uh, uh, great sensation in Nagpur, by the way, which is the city where Taj is famous for in Nagpur, India. And now a professional singer heard about him named Surji. She was famous for an exquisitely sweet voice and would often entertain Tajuddin. It is said that she became seriously ill and, despite all possible treatment, expired. Hearing the news, the Raja Baisol, the gentleman who put up Taj, informed Tajuddin that Surji had died. Tajuddin became very irritated and angrily said, You are lying. She is alive. If I were to die, if she were to die, who is going to sing to me? Go and tell her relatives not to disturb her body. The Raja returned uh, to the house of the woman's body uh, was being prepared for cremation and delivered Tajuddin's message. Having faith in the master's words, the relatives postponed the burial ceremony, and as Tajuddin had indicated, the woman opened her eyes the very next morning. He raises the dead, became the talk of Nagpur for weeks. So, you see, perfect masters, they have at their disposal all these things, and those in the circle of the perfect master would benefit. Now, of course, we may say, well, boy, I wish there was a perfect master around now. Well, of course, possibly. Uh, but the idea of it is, 
it's another thing though going through your your lessons of life and karma to realize that when you do experience your impressions you are getting rid of and free them and freeing them as you live through your pain and suffering and so you may say well I'd like a boon like this too well if you were fortunate enough to be in the circle of a perfect master living perfect master at the time you may of course be part of their enjoyment about their experience and their particular advent Tajuddin Baba dropped his physical body on August 17th 1925 and uh, it's funny Mihir Baba began his silence on July 10th 1925 about a month beforehand and um, he was staying at the Red House on this Maharaja's estate it was called the Red House he gazed out upon our mad world for the last time and closed his eyes forever on this material sphere the madness from the wine the madness from his wine threw Nagpar into a frenzy wine had poured through the streets the asylum and the Raja's palace in Nagpur for nearly 45 years. The news of his death spread fast throughout the district and his devotees felt as their hearts had been torn out when he closed his eyes forever. The whole city mourned the loss of their most holy tavern keeper. Where he had poured wine, tears now flooded. 30 to 40,000 people of all religions, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Zoroastrian, Christian, marched in a huge funeral procession from one end of the city to the other. Tears of love flowed from their eyes and every heart was weighed down with grief, repentance, and gratitude. Well, that ends our first part. We still have two other masters to cover, Upazdi Maharaj and also Sai Baba. Until next time, as Mira Baba says, do your best in life, leave the rest to God. Don't worry, be happy. Jai Baba.